All right, welcome everybody to the 2017 Phys Ed Summit. Uh, on this session, we are going to be talking about occupational socialization of physical educators. And our presenters for this session is our uh, Craig Parks and Nick O'Leary. My name is Jorge Rodriguez. I'm going to be the, um, the moderator for this session. And so just to let everybody know, if there are any uh, technical difficulties, stay on that toggle. If we have to create a new link like we just had to do, um, we'll go ahead and post it on the toggle so that everybody is aware of that. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Craig and Nick, and it's all you. I guess we'll just do a quick introduction while people can uh, can see our faces. So uh, I'm actually, I'm Craig, Craig Parks. I'm based in Pennsylvania uh, in the United States. I'm Nick O'Leary, uh, and I'm currently uh, residing in uh, Ironbridge in the United Kingdom. All right, so I'll, I'll go ahead and share the, uh, the presentation so that we can both start working on that. Can you see the slides okay, Nick? Uh, as yet, no. I can now. Okay, good. Okay, so the title of our presentation is the Occupational Socialization of Physical Educators, uh, a research review and recommendations. And uh, I'm based at Pennsylvania State University in the uh, United States, and Dr. Nick O'Leary, who was actually my uh, undergraduate uh, professor, is uh, at the University of Wolverhampton in the United Kingdom. <clears throat> Just a little biography of, uh, of the both of us. Uh, my contact information is at the top if anyone wants to reach out after this presentation uh, for more information on this uh, topic. But I am a kinesiology instructor at Penn State University. I am just starting my sixth year there uh, and I work in the uh, area that specializes in PE teacher education. Uh, I've recently been uh, offered doctoral candidate status at UNC Greensboro. So I've got a year left, hopefully, of that program. And uh, I'm about to start my data collection, which is on occupational socialization. And I've got a background in PE teaching and soccer coaching and coach education. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, allowing a Brit, another Brit, to uh, invade this uh, conference. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next 20, 25 minutes or so in terms of. Uh, introducing and developing this particular topic. As you can see from the slides, uh, I'm the course leader and senior lecturer, or what you might associate as assistant professor in physical education at the University of Wolverhampton in England. Uh, my research background uh, basically focuses on uh, teacher socialization uh, of physical education teachers. Uh, my background uh, prior to becoming a university uh, assistant professor was 18 years as a PE teacher working in secondary or high schools. Uh, and outside of that, I've uh, spent uh, a lot of time developing my ability to coach basketball and develop courses and coach education for basketball coaches. So I'm just going to give you a brief overview of our uh, presentation. <clears throat> so we're going to start off by talking about the wider um, field of teacher socialization. Then we're going to narrow down into occupational socialization theory specific to PE teachers. Then we're going to do a review of uh, previous so uh, socialization research. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the projects that we're involved in at the moment and then give our recommendations for how we think research uh, should be conducted you know, over the next sort of 10 to 15 years, uh, giving some recommendations. And then at the end, we'll finish with a question and answer session. So I believe that you guys can uh, ask questions through Tozzle. So if you can do that, that would be great. And uh, we'll be happy to answer as many questions as we can when we get to the uh, end of the presentation. Okay, uh, before we get into uh, the actual framework, what I'd like to do is provide you with a brief background uh, to teacher socialization. As it says on the uh, screen, teacher socialization attempts to understand how a person becomes a teacher 
and then how they learn to fulfill and understand their responsibilities as a school teacher. Teacher socialization can be traced back to uh, Waller's classic work, The Sociology of Teaching in 1932. More recent text by Lorty in 1975 and Lacey in 1977 highlighted that how a person actually becomes a teacher provides an insight into how they fulfill those responsibilities. In other words, put simply, teacher socialization provides an explanation of how and why teachers teach in the manner that they do. And in doing so, what it allows us to do as researchers is to look into how they teach, what's influenced how they, how they teach, and hopefully improve pedagogical practice. For these reasons, it's therefore of paramount importance requiring continuous research. There are three main traditions of teacher socialization research, and I'm going to briefly explain each one. Functionalism is put simply that the notion that socialization fits the individual to society. In other words, the purpose of school and university, for example, was to produce an individual that can take his or her place in society. Prior to Lacey's work in 1977, teachers were seen as passive entities that largely conform to this tradition. In contrast, the interpretive approach argues that the individual teacher has considerable agency to turn themselves into the kind of educator the situation demands. Interpretivism believes the teacher can determine what beliefs and behaviors are acquired and what ones are actually ignored. In other words, research studies using this kind of tradition are nominalist, seeing the world largely through names, concepts, and labels by the participants. In other words, human affairs cannot be studied like the natural scientists and teachers have the choice to determine how they teach and how they get students to learn. If interpretism aims for understanding and functionalism is largely concerned with explanation, critical research aims for transformation. In other words, the critical tradition's central purpose is bringing to the consciousness the ability to take what is for granted. Class, gender, and race become key foci given the historical and contemporary alienation of such groups. Such research, that is to say critical research, aims to increase justice, equality, freedom, and dignity. To summarize this section, it would appear that becoming a teacher and that includes PE teachers, is a struggle between an ideal of how the job should be done and the individual needs and aspirations of those wanting to teach. This dialectic process involving the confrontation of contending propositions means that ultimately we have a synthesis and a new design of how a teacher acts as that teacher. On the one hand, they are pressurized to some extent by the institution on how they should teach and their own views. The theoretical framework, occupational socialization, has been used to underpin research examining the contending propositions in PE teacher socialization. Craig will now give an overview of this framework. <coughs> So I'm going to discuss Lawson's occupational socialization theory from 1983. So occupational socialization theory is a perspective which is defined as all kinds of socialization that initially influences someone to enter the field of physical education and is later responsible for their perceptions and actions as pre-service and in-service teachers and teacher educators. When I say pre-service teachers, that's someone that's previous, uh, that's prior to qualified. So that would be someone who's in an undergraduate program. And an in-service teacher would be someone who's qualified and is actually working as a qualified teacher. 
and a teacher educator would obviously be someone with higher education. It consists of three stages, two of which occur before qualified teachers even enter the workplace. And there are four assumptions and three stages associated with occupational socialization theory. Assumption one states that socialization of PE teachers is seen as a lifelong process. This assumption challenges traditional notions that teacher socialization typically begins with higher education experiences that occur as part of a formal teacher training program and continues when people start teaching as qualified educators. It calls attention to early childhood socialization and especially pre-career experiences of physical education, sport and education, which must be linked to teacher socialization. Uh, a personal example of this assumption is that when I was an undergraduate student myself, I would occasionally refer back to some of the instructional strategies and some of the comments and ways of giving feedback that my high school teachers used to give to me back in the 1990s. Uh, we will provide a more detailed description of this assumption when we go over the acculturation stage of socialization and the development of orientation. Assumption two states that operations in PE are institutionalized. The rich history of physical education reveals enduring legacies and these legacies reveal that a way of doing things has often become established and set in stone. This is a sign of institutionalization. For institutions attempt to type class individuals and their actions, and in doing so, set socially acceptable limits of choice. To assume that operations in physical education are institutionalized, then is to assert that pre-service, novice and experienced teachers are subject to socialization that is responsible for their acts to reproduce operations. Institutions are, after all, instruments for social control, not social change. And so it is predictable that the socialization which accompanies them would be directed toward institutional maintenance and sustaining the status quo. An example of this might be a curriculum which remains the same despite a revision in standards or a teacher who continually teaches the same activities year after year. Assumption three states that socialization is always problematic, not automatic. While institutions try to typecast individuals and actions, people also try to transform institutions. This suggests a social tug of war between institutions and people where each has the capacity to shape the other. Teachers then are not passive in the face of socialization and they may employ one of three socialization strategies. They may engage in short-term compliance and impression management or accept and internalize the contents, the contents of socialization or act to change the socialization setting and in turn the formal contents count contents of the socialization that first greeted them <coughs> last strategy is innovative the second custodial and the first a kind of fence sitting that may later uh, result in either custodial or an innovative response i have seen examples of this when my undergraduate students have student calls and the mentor teachers have challenged some of the strategies and ideas that I and other faculty members have passed on to the students. Student teachers often feel that they have to side with the mentor teacher because they are their immediate supervisor for that eight week period. Assumption four states that there are three stages of socialization experienced by teachers, both formally and directly and informally and indirectly. The three stages of socialization are known as acculturation, professional and organizational socialization. The acculturation stage begins at birth and continues until an individual enters a physical education training program. During this stage, individuals are typically influenced by teachers, coaches, parents and their peers. These individuals begin to construct ideas about what physical education should be about, how to instruct and what content to cover. The acculturation stage is an extremely powerful period of time, which leads to the development of teaching related orientations, which will be discussed in more detail later on in the presentation. 
The professional socialization stage refers to a formal physical education degree or training program and it includes the student teaching process. During this stage, pre-service teachers are influenced by professors who either support or challenge the orientations, values and beliefs developed through the acculturation stage. The organisational stage refers to the school workplace environment. During this stage, teachers may be influenced by colleagues, the administration, pupils, the, the school culture and the resources and facilities available. During this period, novice and recently qualified teachers are exposed to the school's culture and the practices of senior members of staff. And now we're going to go back to Nick, who's going to uh, give us some information on prior occupational socialisation theory research. Uh, a lit review tends to suggest that prior occupational socialisation theory research can be split into five groups. It appears that uh, notable academics have examined uh, pedagogical approaches using instructional modules such as tactile games and sport education amongst others. Secondly, uh, it's been used to examine how teachers, student and qualified teachers actually implement various policies. It's been used to evaluate PE teachers' work in specific areas of the subject. Sutherland and Stir in 2012 looked specifically at outdoor ed or adventure education. Uh, Kurtner Smith and Lee and Cusack have examined how PE students become doctoral researchers. And finally, uh, it's been used as a framework to examine those factors that influence PE teachers teaching and learning practices with children that experience special educational needs and disabilities. An overview of the research findings uh, is the next part of our presentation and it will examine the three stages that Craig has briefly outlined, that is to say acculturation, professional socialization, and organizational socialization. Acculturation, as Craig has already mentioned, has been often identified as the most influential stage on how teachers teach and encourage children to learn. It would appear that the years spent observing as a pupil participating in PE lessons, sports clubs, and sport seems to influence prospective PE teachers in one of two ways. One, it allows them to observe PE teachers plying their trade and gives uh, prospective PE teachers some idea of the attributes, skills, and responsibilities that are required to do the job. And secondly, it appears to develop an attraction to physical activity and particularly sport. And it's these two influences that provide prospective teachers with a strong belief of what physical education is actually about. It's to the first of those influences, that is to say PE teachers, that I've now turned my attention. It's been suggested that children in schools, both in the United Kingdom and in the United States, have approximately 13,000 hours of contact with teachers by the time they leave compulsory education. This apprenticeship of observation, as Lorty calls it, provides these potential teachers with the perceptions of the requirements of teacher education and actual teaching in schools. This is what Lorty refers to as the subjective warrant. However, this subjective warrant has inherent weaknesses. Shemp in 1987 suggested that the subjective warrant only provided pupils or students with a rough indication about what teaching actually involves. In other words, the teaching role is merely intuitive and imitative rather than explicit and analytical. In other words, what pupils or students seem to pick up from PE teachers 
is more about personalities than pedagogical aspects. And so while it does not necessarily provide a pedagogical role model for potential teachers, what it does do is it can influence students' decisions to follow in their footsteps. What is a concern, and it's been identified by Capel in the United Kingdom in 2007, is that often students get a very poor subjective warrant because it's riddled with errors and or poor practice. And in many ways, and this has certainly been seen in the United States as well, PE can often be viewed and taught as merely recreation or a break from more serious academic subjects. Socialization into sport may even be a more powerful factor than education and the observing of other teachers. In the United Kingdom, Evans in 1992 identified what he called a sporting perspective, focusing on the development of physical or practical skills within a meritocratic system, fostering a love of sport amongst all pupils while securing the potential for the elite child. Indeed, Capel has argued that PE teachers in the United Kingdom often fail to see the difference between physical education and sport. This issue has also been seen in the United States with a number of different orientations. The closest perhaps to the sporting perspective of the UK is a coaching orientation whereby American potential PE teachers also fail to recognize the difference between PE and sports coaching and go down a very direct approach to physical education. Lawson, back in 1983, identified teaching and coaching orientations, and much research has been done, particularly by Kurtner Smith, on these two orientations. More recently, a further orientation, that is to say a fitness orientation, has also come to the floor as a result of Richard's and Pad Ruth's work in 2017. It is to these three orientations that Craig will now uh, develop and introduce them to a, to a uh, deeper level. I'll probably read to has suggested that acculturation experiences prior to enrolling in a physical education training program result in prospective students possessing orientations which are related to teaching and coaching. Students who possess teaching orientations have typically been female, were involved in non-traditional forms of physical activity as opposed to competitive team sports during their youth and participated in high quality PE programs. Teaching oriented students are more likely to be open minded to the messages being delivered by university faculty because it's congruent with their ideology of what physical education is about. In contrast, students who possess coaching orientations tended to be male, participated in competitive youth sport at an elite level and experienced low quality physical education programming. These students are more likely to uh, want to enhance their coaching prowess and are less responsive to the influences of university faculty and university content. However, recent research has identified a third orientation that is related to fitness, which could be associated with the landscape and goals of current physical education, which are influenced by the government's position in addressing concerns regarding the health of children and adolescents. Research into this orientation is minimal, so it has mainly been hypothesized that fitness-oriented students appreciate movement in relation to wellness, place a high value on lifelong physical fitness, and combating childhood obesity, and would consider non-traditional activities such as Doomba, CrossFit, and yoga an important part of a PE curriculum. Previously, a student with a balanced orientation was considered to be someone who placed an equal amount of value on physical education teaching and extracurricular sports coaching. However, in order to be considered in possession of a balanced orientation, one must now also value the importance of fitness goals in PE 
because the linear orientation spectrum now resembles a triangle. One of the things I like about this new orientation figure is that individuals can be located in a corner, along a line, or within the triangle itself, as highlighted by some of my dissertation orientation, self-identification pilot data. One of the important things to consider with acculturation and the development of orientations is that school students are often observing teachers who may not be the best professional role models. This means that students often have beliefs and values that are riddled with pedagogical errors based on observing poor instructional practices of teachers whose beliefs and values are often resistant to change. We now move to the second stage, which is professional socialization. Uh, and it would seem to be extremely difficult to underdo, undo 16 years or 13,000 hours of educational observation with a few years of university stroke teacher education. The likely impact of university and teacher training programs on PE students would appear to be minimal particularly given they can enter higher education with formed perceptions of themselves as teachers, the technical skills, and the conceptions required to teach. All of these have been acquired through acculturation as previously described. Research in the United States has argued that physical education, teacher education, or PEAT programs can often suffer from a lack of consistency with staff having contradictory views regarding education, schooling, and physical education. This lack of a shared technical culture amongst PEAT staff provides contradictory messages for students in the teaching of physical education and games. It's also common sense to suggest that those undertaking a degree in, the, in uh, the United Kingdom are also likely to receive similar contradictory messages. The major impact if students receive contradictory messages is that they tend to revert back to their acculturation uh, orientations uh, and the experiences they've received in school and as a result of sport. And that can often mean a very traditional approach. One of my own issues as a course leader for the PE degree is in employing various staff at my own university, I've always tried to employ and look for staff who have a similar philosophical relational approach to the subject as I do to ensure that our students at undergraduate level get a similar message, whoever happens to be lecturing them. In the United Kingdom, uh, the sporting perspective, which we've also identified, can also have a conservative impact on the professional socialization stage. And as mentioned previously, one of the issues that often we find is that, again, students believe sport and physical education to be very similar. And for that reason, all, they've, all they do is they delivered what might be described as watered down sports sessions in physical education. If we can move on, Craig, to organizational. The third stage is organizational socialization. As the slide suggests, while the impact of parents and senior school staff stroke administers, uh, administrators rather, can have an impact on PE teachers' pedagogical practices, the two most influential would appear to be the influence of their colleagues and the influence of students themselves. And it's to the first of those that I'm now going to draw uh, your attention. It's argued that the influence of colleagues can have the most significant impact on the organizational socialization of PE teachers. It's often said PE teachers are very, very different from other teachers in terms of their attire, teaching environment, and clearly the practicality of the subject. And these things set them apart from their, from their colleagues. 
These factors often result in PE teachers bonding very closely with other PE teachers in the same school. And as a result, the impact and the influence of colleagues can be extremely powerful. When newly qualified PE teachers enter their first job and subsequent job, they often will meet staff who want continuity or the status quo. And as a result, the new teacher learns and accepts and implements the customary strategies. This passing down of knowledge and experiences to the inexperienced teacher is known as the institutional press. And this press, as stated previously, tends to encourage the status quo. Innovative teachers from university or colleges often feel obliged to adapt their behavior and their views and practice because experienced teachers generally dislike change. Obviously, if the views and beliefs of the incoming teacher are similar to the experienced colleagues, these are likely to be reinforced. In simple English, it's very difficult for new PE teachers to teach significantly different from their colleagues. The structuring of the new teachers' organizational socialization was outlined in Van Mann's and Schein's 1979 seminal work, and I would draw your attention to that work. The second major factor during organizational socialization is themselves. Lawson, back in 1988, suggested that American physical education programs will depend on what pupils will permit. He argues that student characteristics, actions, and teacher perceptions of them will influence what the students receive. He goes on to suggest this is more likely to occur in what he describes as manual subjects like PE than mental subjects such as mathematics. However, it has to be said that while the things may have changed since 1988, the isolation of PE teachers from other teachers and the transient nature of much of the learning process may make, in some small way, the socialization of PE teachers more susceptible to the influence of the students. Fuller has suggested that mature, student, mature teachers become more concerned with the impact of their teaching on, on students' learning. They are able to become more learner-centered rather than teacher-centered. In summary, there is considerable evidence to suggest that organizational socialization can typically encourage a custodial orientation to teacher and pupil learning. However, there is evidence to suggest that this is not always the case. While one might expect policies, schools to provide some degree of a consensus of thought or practice on pedagogy, this appears dependent on the teacher's biography, the influence of colleagues and pupils. Research seems to indicate the acceptance of colleagues may be more important for PE teachers than other staff. The needs of pupils may encourage learner center approaches to teaching as the teacher gains experience. We are now going to present our current research using this socialization framework. So I am uh, currently involved in two different research projects investigating the occupational socialization of uh, potential physical educators. The first one is my doctoral dissertation, which investigates how acculturation influences uh, orientations of students enrolled in a hybrid PE slash fitness studies major and how these orientations impact student learning related to how they interpret and deliver the teaching games for understanding model. This data will hopefully allow me to develop a set of pedagogical strategies for physical education faculty so that they can best instruct students with various 
socialization orientation there are two really unique elements to this study first no prior studies have recruited students enrolled in a hybrid program like this and this is a new program that we that we've got at penn state that i'm looking to uh, to use and secondly this newly identified fitness orientation has not really been empirically investigated um, I've got a little bit of uh, pilot data on it, and the only other data that's out there was uh, was hypothesised. The second study that I am involved in is investigating how acculturation influences an individual's decision to enrol in a physical education degree programme and to pursue a career in PE teaching. This study is currently proving difficult to identify and recruit participants, possibly due to the age of the participants and the dramatic decrease is seen in the number of students enrolled in PE degree programs nationally. This may explain why there is currently limited literature available on the acculturation stage, apart from data that is typically retrospective in nature. Nick? Uh, I have three current projects underway uh, and I'm going to briefly discuss the, the, the first two. In the United Kingdom, physical education teachers often after a number of years seem to appear to go into pastoral roles such as head of year or head of curriculum or head of grades 12 and 13. Uh, and it's assumed that PE teachers are well suited to this role given their learning environment is somewhat different and as a result they have a, a different and a perhaps what might be perceived as a better in inverted commas relationship with students. PE teachers are often seen as being very well organized and being somewhat old-fashioned PE teachers are also seen as very good disciplinarians when it is required. The first study with uh, Adam Burrows at Edge Hill University in the UK is looking at the impact of occupational socialization on a high school teacher's role as a head of year. The second study that I'm involved with uh, is examining factors influencing a PE teacher's pedagogical games practices to pupils experiencing special educational needs and disabilities. Research from the United States tends to suggest that PE teachers who are extremely gifted at sport tend to teach in a very conservative or coaching orientated way, as previously outlined by Craig. Interestingly, I have a uh, physical education teacher who is a Great Britain international basketball player and has won 13 national titles. And early indications indicate that with special educational needs and disability students, this particular teacher tends to teach and encourages learning more in social learning than in practical. The reasons for this as yet are unknown as we have yet to complete uh, all the data analysis. Over to you, Craig. So we're just going to give our future research recommendations where we think the, uh, the, the field of study should move in the future. So I uh, believe there are three key areas of occupational socialization that need to be investigated moving forward. First, the influence of this theory on sports coaches. Little research has been conducted or published on the socialization of sports coaches since the work of stage in the late 1980s. Sports coaches and physical edu education teachers obviously perform very similar roles and therefore go through similar stages of uh, occupational socialization. Therefore, I am interested in investigating this career path further with both professional and collegiate coaches in various countries. Second, I am interested in conducting studies on the newly identified fitness orientation and the revised balanced orientation that will complement my dissertation pilot data. This orientation is very new and therefore warrants a significant amount of attention. Because the orientation spectrum now has three possible points instead of just two, the balanced orientation is also now different in that it includes teaching, coaching and fitness values. 
I have identified two qualified teachers who have self-identified themselves as having a balanced orientation based on the triangle diagram shown in figure one. So I am interested in looking into what has influenced them to possess this new type of balanced orientation. My final recommendation is to compare and contrast the occupational socialization stages and experiences of pre-service and in-service teachers in different countries. Having myself been trained in the UK and now working as a lecturer in the United States, I obviously am interested in the similarities and differences of socialization in these two countries. And I feel that a lot can be learned from the way uh, people are socialized in different countries in order to provide recommendations for future educators to have a greater impact on their students in both compulsory schooling and higher educational settings. Nick? As you can see, the top three uh, are very similar to the research that I'm carrying out at the minute. There is very, very little research at all on the impact of PE teachers or PE student teachers experiences of fulfilling other educational roles. The doctoral research work of uh, Cusack and Curtin, Smith and Lee is one example, and my own one looking at uh, a pastoral role uh, appears to be it. I, I think clearly that uh, there's opportunities to look at PE teachers fulfilling other roles such as principal and pastoral responsibilities. There's very little research being conducted uh, around how elementary or what we refer to as primary teachers in the United Kingdom, their pedagogical practices, how they can be improved and what's impacted on them. And thirdly, again, very little research has been conducted on PE teachers' socialization experiences with those students experiencing special educational needs and disabilities. In addition, uh, Richards, who I know is a, a very powerful academic in the United States in this area, has suggested that other theoretical frameworks such as role theory could be used alongside occupational uh, socialization theory, and we both would support that recommendation. Given the relative brevity of this particular uh, presentation, uh, we would also like to draw your attention to uh, Richards and, and Goldroth's excellent uh, book from 2017, which has a, a plethora of further fu future research recommendations in addition to the uh, few that we've outlined here. So we've just got several pages of uh, references related to this field of study that will obviously be uh, archived with this presentation for you to uh, for you to look at and obviously our contact information is on the, the very front uh, sorry on the second slide if you wanted to reach out uh, we're going to go to a question and answer session now so i'm going to try and leave this presentation and get back to our, uh, our hangout can you guys see me yes sir. i can see you very clearly okay Oh, I guess I'll uh, hand it to you then. Do we have some questions? Yes, so we have a couple questions uh, that did come up. Um, one of them was about the uh, about the poor role models in physical education. Do you see that specifically in physical education or in other disciplines as well? I'll, um, I'll, I'll take a start at answering that. I've certainly seen that an awful lot um, when I'm observing student teachers. Um, I can't really comment on, on what I've seen with regards to other subjects because I'm primarily, you know, just working in the field of health and physical education. But um, I can certainly give one good example from when I was observing student teachers uh, in my role at, at Penn State. So I, um, I saw a, a student teacher who uh, delivered a pretty poor gymnastic session and it was very unsafe so there was a kind of handstands and headstands done with like first grade kids which to me is a is a big no-no you know when they when this uh, same kid has tried to do a, a headstand like four times and has kind of landed on their back four times and i've had to kind of step in and say like this is this is not good 
when I actually did a little bit more research into where she'd learn these practices from, it was from the actual uh, like cooperative teacher, so the mentor teacher at the school. And when I stuck around a little bit to watch the the, uh, the mentor teacher, I saw that um, she taught the same lesson to sort of first grade, second grade, third grade, and fourth grade, all in the all in the same day. So there was no real kind of uh, progression for the students. So that was certainly one thing where you know you don't want your um, your students that you work with for several years going in and, and learning that kind of that kind of practice. And I've seen examples of it when I uh, when I taught in the in the UK as well. Uh, Nick Nick had more experience in the schools than me, so Nick might want to chime in on this and some of the some of the things that he's seen. But yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I've probably seen a little bit more poor practice than I have seen positive practice over over the last ten or fifteen years. Nick, I think you've got to first of all recognise that the power of acculturation and children students watching PE teachers for years and years and years what they do becomes common sense in nature and it becomes something of an evaluation screen through which everything else then passes and as a result children quite clearly are unable to identify what what is good practice and what is poor practice but it becomes very very stable in terms of their beliefs around the subject uh, and there is, I'm afraid to say, plenty of poor practice in the United Kingdom and research indicates the same is true in the United States. Secondly, I think you have to recognize that student PE teachers in universities and colleges have always valued teaching practices or capstone experiences is far more valuable than theoretical lectures. Lorty, Sue, K. Paul 2007 have all suggested these. And what that is, is it gives the teachers, the student teachers, an opportunity to observe children, teachers, and schools on a daily basis. What it also does is it reinforces the notion that the practice of teaching is far more important than theoretical work in developing students' knowledge for teaching. And as a result, what tends to happen is that students, that's to say PE undergraduate students, accept or prioritize school-based work rather than university-based parts of the course. And what that can do is that can also reinforce poor practice if that's what's observed on a capstone experience. Finally, quite clearly, as I've stated previously, it's extremely difficult for a rookie teacher to observe their more experienced colleagues and 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 have what might be described as independent pedagogical approaches. I can remember back to my own experiences where I look back on experienced teachers as a newly qualified PE teacher, and I largely aped the behaviors, mannerisms, practices of those teachers, whether they be good or bad. And that's extremely worrying. Oh, hey, I think you muted your microphone. Yeah, I was muted. Sorry about that. So I think we have time for one more question. Um, and it was, uh, what was the reason you see that more PE teachers are moving to pastoral roles? And could that have something to do with the physical demand of uh, physical education? It could do. I think quite clearly I'm, <laughs> I'm 54. Uh, and I moved out of PE teaching when I was... Uh, approximately 40. I didn't move out of it because of a lack of physicality, although 54 now it would probably be a wise move. Uh, what we often find in the United Kingdom, and I can't comment in the United States, perhaps Craig can in a minute or two, is that the opportunities for promotion in physical education in the UK are somewhat limited. And as a result, PE teachers often find themselves almost inadvertently going down this pastoral route to suddenly get themselves to be deputy principal or principal of a school. Craig, in the States? Yeah, it's the same. It's the same. You know, once, you, uh, once you transition from sort of a, a PE teacher to a head of department, you're really kind of stuck. There's nowhere else to go. 
uh, promotion wise unless you kind of I guess leave and go into maybe higher education or you uh, go into some kind of administrative role um, at the school like maybe an athletic director or some kind of vice principal or someone who's in charge of, of some kind of pastoral care so yeah in my experience over here a lot of it is to do with once you're ahead of PE a lot of the time there's, there's nowhere else really really to go promotion wise except for into those administrative roles All right. Well, I think that is our time. So I definitely want to thank everybody who joined in on the uh, on the session here. And I want to say thank you to Craig and Nick for uh, for presenting for us. And I wanted to remind everybody also uh, to go to the Physetagogy website after the Physet Summit uh, and fill out the feedback survey so we can get some information on what you thought about the about the uh, Physet Summit. And also, that's where you can find your your professional development certificate. And I also put a link to the Flipgrid on the Tazel. So if you'd like to give us some video reflection, or trying something new with the Flipgrid, uh, check that out as well and uh, give us some feedback. So once again, thank you guys for, uh, for joining and thank you for presenting. Thank you. Thank you very much.